Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about the idea of making do with what you have. While everybody on Earth makes do with what they have, because they have things and they exist, so by definition they're making do with what they have, that idiom is generally used to describe situations where one has less or receives less than they anticipated, wanted, or needed, and they have to figure out how to proceed and accomplish their goal. Or because I'm not an English major and I'm not good at describing the intricacies of language, let's use the much simpler definition of making do with something from the Cambridge Dictionary. To use what is available, although it is not enough or what you wanted. Everyone has to make do in this way. You can't get what you want all the time, and sometimes you have to just settle with what you have. For an example of this, we'll stick with some history and not talk about Mega Man or something random, and we'll look at the U.S. Civil War. For both the Union and the Confederacy, they both had to make do with what they had, but in slightly different ways in large part due to the economic makeup of each force. When the Civil War started, neither side had enough of what was then considered modern weaponry to outfit their forces. This would then force both sides to delve into their old weapon stocks and grab Grandpappy's old musket from the closet and just use what they found until more advanced weaponry could be procured. So while most probably picture Civil War soldiers using Colt revolvers and rifled muskets, some soldiers were stuck with old smoothbore muskets, pepper box revolvers, and muzzle-loading single-shot pistols. Realistically, it wouldn't be shocking if somewhere in the war, a soldier took his dad's old flintlock or even matchlock musket and had to use that. Hell, maybe somebody even used an ancient hand cannon like they were in the 15th century. But even though both sides suffered from shortages of modern weaponry, the Union was much more well-equipped to overcome that shortage, having far greater industrial capabilities. While the Confederacy did still have some in the way of industrial production, it wasn't nearly to the same level or degree and this forced them to then look at other sources. This led to the Confederacy relying a bit more on foreign arms purchases or just post-battle scavenging for weapons. Moving over into the realm of aviation, our subjects for today are a clear example of a country trying to just make do with what they had. What do you do? when the enemy has advanced jet-powered aircraft with powerful cannons, and you have comparatively little in the way of even advanced piston engines. Well, if you're the Soviet Union, you make a sort of makeshift jet engine and just hope it works out. These are a couple of late World War II Soviet motor jet fighters. This is the Sukhoi Su-5, and this is the Mikoyan Gurevich I-250, also known as the MiG-13. The story of these rudimentary jet fighters begins in early 1944, with the Soviets increasingly gaining back some lost territory and Germany increasingly going on the defensive. However, Germany was and is quite well known for pushing the technological envelope and making all manner of weird, advanced, and or impractical designs. And in early 1944, the Soviets, both with the knowledge that their fellow Allied powers were making a lot of progress on jet engine technology, and that Germany was close to deploying jet and rocket-powered aircraft, a la the ME-262 and the ME-163, they felt that they needed to keep pace with both enemy and ally, and develop their own jet-powered aircraft. However, Soviet industrial capabilities for a major power in World War II lagged pretty far behind the other major Western powers, and they didn't have jet engine technology to fit on a new plane, and they basically wouldn't until they reverse-engineered a captured German-made jet engine. 
so this left them in a bit of a pickle. How do you perform as well as a jet-powered fighter without a jet engine? For most of World War II, when piston engines reigned supreme, the Soviets made up for their lesser engine and industrial technology by having smaller, lighter, and simpler aircraft. But for the jet engine pickle, their solution, in addition to making the fighters comparatively smaller and lighter, was to make a sort of jet engine, a proto-jet engine, if you will, in the motor jet. Conceived of back in the early 1900s and 1910s, the motor jet basically combined a more normal piston engine with a compressor, functioning much like later turbojet engines that used a gas turbine the piston engine would be driving the compressor. The compressor then fed into the combustion chamber, where additional fuel is injected, mixed in, and ignited, and this ignition provides the thrust out of the exhaust. Now, overall, this setup is generally heavier and less efficient than your typical turbojet, which is why the motor jet concept has seen rather little use throughout history. But for the Soviets and their inferior manufacturing capabilities, the fact that the motor jet did output more power than a standard piston engine driven propeller made it an interesting middle ground option. So in January or February 1944, when the Soviet military ordered several companies and producers to begin research and development of new jet powered fighters, Sukhoi and MiG elected to pursue that middle ground option, as it was their only realistic option at that time. Known simply as the VRDK, their powerhouse of choice had been under development since 1941, and in its official form, it was kind of less a full-blown motor jet engine, and more of just a temporary booster. If the motor jet was a proto-jet engine, the VRDK was a proto-proto-jet engine. The main source of power of the VRDK would be the Klimov VK-107 piston engine, with around 1600 horsepower. The VK-107 would be connected to both a standard propeller and the compressor at the same time. On takeoff and for most of the plane's flight, the engine would only be driving the propeller, but at the pilot's discretion, a switch could be flipped and the engine would start driving both the propeller and the compressor, temporarily making the plane a mixed power aircraft with a total power output of around 2,500 horsepower. However, this was very much a temporary thing, and the VRDK was only designed to function for around 10 minutes before it was completely spent, and the compressor would have to be deactivated. Even with that severe time limitation, though, it was the only realistic option for Sukhoi and MiG, so it's what they decided to design new fighters around. Initially, they wanted to use the VRDK on an existing design, but quickly discovered that they had nothing that could actually fit the thing, necessitating all new unique designs. And the first one to the table was MiG, with their I-250 or MiG-13 design. Measuring in at just 8.19 meters long, 9.5 meters wide, and 3.7 meters tall, the I-250 was a diminutive low-wing monoplane with a cockpit that sat relatively far to the rear, presumably to balance weight. Up in the nose, sitting under the Klimov VK-107 engine was the air intake for the engine's oil cooler, the engine's supercharger, and the motor jet's compressor. Around the midpoint of the plane, sitting just in front of the cockpit was that compressor. Sitting just behind it would be two sets of sprayers and some igniters. One of the sprayer sets, seven nozzles in total, would dispense fuel into a welded steel combustion chamber to be ignited by the igniters and boost the total energy in the chamber. And to make sure that the chamber didn't overheat and start damaging other parts of the plane, 
the second sprayer set made sure it stayed at a reasonable temperature. On board was a 17-gallon water tank, and it would spray on the inner walls of the chamber. Not only did this have a cooling effect, but when the water turned to steam because of the heat, it further increased the total pressure in the chamber, thus increasing the energy and the amount of thrust. Finally, all of that pressure and energy would be fired out of the exhaust on the tail, and unlike most other jet aircraft, the exhaust opening was more of a slit rather than a circle. While I couldn't find a listed reason for this, I would assume it was to try and increase thrust, like how a nozzle on a hose increases pressure. For offensive purposes, as it was created to defend against German jet fighters, it would have a pretty powerful armament as Soviet fighters went, with three total 20 mil cannons with 160 rounds per cannon. One of them would fire centrally through the propeller, and the other two fired from either side of the cowling. This total armament would put it on par with something like the Lavochkin LA-7, which was introduced in mid-1944. By October 1944, MiG had built and had approved a mock-up of the I-250, and just a few months later, on February 26, 1945, the first I-250 prototype, given the official name of N-1, was finished and rolled out onto the runway. About a week later, on March 3rd, it took to the air, and a short time after that, it took to the air and fired up the VRDK for the first time. The initial impressions of the motor jet system and the I-250 as a whole were a little bit mixed, but definitely more on the positive side. There were some issues with instability, and the VRDK was noted to be incredibly loud and irritating to be around, but that didn't really matter since it's not like the I-250 was a stealth plane. Much more importantly, when the VRDK was active, it was noted to boost the top speed by over 60 miles an hour, and the maximum top speed of the I-250 sat above the 500 mile an hour mark, hitting 513. This also means that the top speed of the I-250 without the VRDK was around 440 miles an hour, which was still excellent. However, by May 1945, the project would suffer a setback after the first prototype was lost in a crash that also killed the test pilot. The cause of this crash was likely excessive G-forces leading to the destruction of the tail surfaces, which then made the pilot lose control. Luckily for MiG, though, the second prototype was almost finished, and it would be a little bit different than the first one. The first one had a full armament installed, and the second one had no armament whatsoever. The second one would also have enlarged tail surfaces to try and remedy the initial instability issues. And to avoid a repeat of the first prototype, the second one was not to exceed the 500 mile an hour mark. With these alterations and restrictions, the second prototype lasted much longer than the first, surviving until mid-1946, where a forced landing ended up destroying it. And while it was undergoing testing and was still active, the Soviet government ordered that 10 I-50s be built and be ready to fly by November 7, 1945, for a military parade in celebration of October Revolution Day which kind of seemed like it was 4th of July for the Soviet Union. Surprisingly, the planes were actually made in time, or at least 9 out of 10 were, but poor weather on that day meant that they never flew in the parade. By late 1946, despite the fact that purely jet-powered Soviet fighters like the Yak-15 and MiG-9 were in development and had taken to the air, 16 official production model I-250s, given the new designation of MiG-13, were ordered. This order was actually fulfilled, and by mid-1948 they were delivered to their units. 
where they would serve wholly uneventfully until being replaced in 1950. All the while, in the background of the I-250 project, Sukhoi was also developing a very similar motor jet fighter, measuring 8.51 meters long, 10.56 meters wide, and a height that is not specified, the Su-5 was slightly larger than the MiG-13, about a third of a meter longer and a full meter wider. The general layout of the design was pretty similar, although the cockpit was more towards the center of the fuselage rather than towards the rear, and the exhaust on the tail was more circular than just a little slit. Internally, though, the motor jet engine configuration was basically the same, and the Su-5 would also have a three-gun armament, but instead of three 20mm cannons, it had one 23mm cannon and two 12.7mm machine guns. Taking to the air for the first time on April 6, 1945, the performance and career of the Su-5 was a bit more disappointing and a lot less eventful than the MiG-13. The maximum achieved top speed sat just under the 500 mile an hour mark, hitting 493, which was below the estimated max speed of 503, but above the speed they anticipated hitting of around 477, so better than they expected but worse than what they wanted. The Su-5 was still expected to hit that max speed somewhere down the line in testing, but the project would see the beginning of the end on July 15, 1945, as the VK-107 engine failed and needed to be replaced. Engine failures were very common for the VK-107, and it's rather surprising that there weren't any listed failures in the MiG-13 project. Sukhoi would receive a replacement engine, but by the next month, this engine too had failed, necessitating another replacement. However, as World War II was coming to a close, as jet engines were advancing in their development, and as Sukhoi struggled to secure another VK-107 engine, the Su-5 project would come to a very quiet end. So, ultimately, these sort of emergency fighters designed to defend the Soviets from German jet fighters ended up doing basically nothing and were largely just a waste of time. That's not to say they weren't interesting or even potentially solid aircraft that needed a bit more seasoning, since they did hit 400 plus miles an hour even without the jet component, but their interim make-do-with-what-you-have nature combined with when they were made in the war, made them ultimately kind of pointless. They were stuck in that weird area at the end of World War II, where military spending began winding down, a lot of projects lost urgency, and a new era of power was coming into prominence. So, in a way, the Su-5 and the MiG-13 show that making do with what you have sometimes isn't necessarily the best option. Maybe you just need to wait things out, come across somebody else's stuff, and then just copy that. That's what the Soviets did, and it worked for them. At least for as long as they existed, I guess. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So, as I'm recording this, it's the 4th of July. Well, technically it's the morning after 4th of July, since it's like 2.30 in the morning. And I had this plan of popping just one of those little party poppers here, just to see if it made it onto the mic. You know, it's like a little celebration of 4th of July. And then I went to the store, and for some reason they were sold out of them. And then I didn't feel like going to another store. So now I'm just going to tell you about this plan. And this plan failed. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!